Hey everybody, happy Torch Thursday, hopefully. Everyone is having a wonderful Thursday, or at least as happy Thursday is over because it pretty much is. So whatever your reaction to to um, this particular time on a Thursday, I hope it's a good one. Welcome to the Beating Dreams Torch Thursday stream. Um, yes, we are gonna be using torches and hammers and all of the tools, like my streaming area is so full of tools that I don't have any place to put my my mug except for like right there you know where I also need to put other things in a minute so yeah so many tools I keep I, I kept the marker out because I keep forgetting tools and adding to my tool list for this evening's tutorial all right so what are we doing tonight we are aside from you know watching me struggle with all these tools we're doing this ring which I called the halo ring actually Super, see, there's my mug, because that's the only place to put it. Um, super happy with this ring. Um, actually, something that came out of my own head completely. I mean, I'm 100% certain that this is not an original concept for a ring, because nothing is original in this world. But definitely, um, yes, I was, Amy, and now I'm showing it on camera. Um, but yeah, definitely was really happy with the way this turned out, and we'll absolutely make more of these. I'm so excited, because this is a faceted cut gemstone. So most of the tutorials that we do here on the Beating Dream stream um, focus on cabochons and rose cuts, you know, things with a flat back, which is great. But if you like glitter, like a lot of us do, faceted stones really are the way to go. Also a little bit of um, trivia, this um, extra super sparkly stone in my ring is a strontium titanate, which I promise is actually a real thing. Um, and it's <laughs> and it's actually even prettier um, in real life. It's got little glints of kind of green and red. So strontium titanate is um, one of the very early diamond simulants. Um, so it was one of the very early um, attempts to create a synthetic diamond. And it was one of those diamond simulants that failed because it was actually too refractive. It didn't look like a real diamond because it refracted too many colors, actually had too high of a refractive index. And so that you don't really see strontium titanates anymore. I bought that in um, Denver a couple years ago with somebody who's selling off her collection of old things. So um, they yes. should make it. I know, right? It's so freaking sparkly and pretty with all of the like glints of like the reds and the green. That's the I don't want it as index. a pretend diamond. So so yeah, it's it's one of those things that it's terrible as a pretend diamond, but it's good as a real itself. Um, I'm not, not gonna. I only have one strontium titanate. This ring. Notice, I actually finally made a class sample that fits me. Like this ring is actually going to be going to be mine after this stream because <laughs> I am definitely in love with this stone. So I'm going to be using um, a blue cubic zirconia for my actual tutorial this evening. All right, so let's just talk tools and supplies. There's a freaking ton of them. I guarantee I've forgotten some. I'll tell you what I forgot when I remember that I forgot it. Let's start with supplies because there aren't as many supplies as there are tools. You're going to need some sheet metal. Um, sterling silver sheet metal again just kind of a brief review when we're and you can see this was from my prototype where I cut out my circle we're gonna be using the disc cutter um, love my disc cutter oh my gosh like the the gal that gave it to us I, I want to send her like a, you know a bouquet of flowers because this is the best thing ever or three we definitely have more disc cutter classes coming up next week, but 24 gauge sheet metal. I'm doing my ring in sterling silver again. Um, when you are fabricating sterling silver, 14 karat gold, brass, bronze, and copper, those are going to be your metals um, that you can fabricate with. I'm doing this in sterling silver because some things like the half round wire are difficult to find in other metals. So 24 gauge sterling silver sheet. Also, you could do this in mixed metals because the most expensive part of this project is definitely the sheet metal because you can't just get I mean what what did I actually use to cut this you know circle out it's it's basically you know one half inch by three quarters of an inch of sterling sheet but you can't get that you know usually the smallest increment of sterling silver sheet you can buy is like um, you know one inch by three inches which is you know gonna cost you not an arm and a leg but it's gonna cost you a solid 20 30 bucks so you could definitely do the sheet metal part of this which of course is you know is this circle that you see right here you could absolutely do the sheet metal part of this in brass bronze or copper and then just do the wire in sterling silver so there's nothing wrong with mixing metals also this is a good um, this is a really good candidate for a mixed metal piece because you'll notice that the setting 
it's not touching my finger at all. So that is one of the things when you're mixing metals, when you're using brass bonds and copper for fabricated pieces, um, for a lot of people, especially in the Texas heat, those base metals will turn their fingers colors, which is fine if you're if you're you know making it for yourself and you're okay with that. But sometimes clients, you know, people who purchase your jewelry who aren't necessarily used to that, you know, can get a little weirded out by the fact that they wear your ring and all of a sudden their fingers black or green. So if you notice, this setting is nowhere near my finger. So I could totally use a base metal for this circle and it would not affect, um, it would not react with the skin on my finger at all, which is pretty nice. So sheet metal in whatever metal you want to use, um, but this is 24 gauge. Since this is the base, you know, the base and the holder for your prongs, you don't want to get too thin on this. So 24 gauge is good. You're going to need some wire for the band and you can really use almost anything, but I have chosen for this project because I like the look of it. 10 gauge half round wire. Half round of course is called so because it is flat on one side. See the flat side and round on the other side. You're going to need a stone of some sort. So for my project tonight, I'm using this super sparkly blue topaz colored cubic zirconia. This is not an actual blue topaz. This is a CZ because that was what I grabbed first and also because, hey, look, sparkle. Um, you can use pretty much anything. Um, 10 gauge soft was a question that was just asked on the stream. Here's an interesting thing. Once you get above, I think, 16 gauge, they stop offering half hard as an option because um, the wire is just so thick that having it in a half hard is makes it almost impossible to work with. So once you get above 16 gauge, um, soft is pretty much your only option. Plus, if you're going to solder it, you will be annealing it as you solder it. So even if it is half hard, you're going to be turning it back to its dead soft state. So there's absolutely no point in ever purchasing half hard wire if you're going to solder it. But that being said, even if you have half hard wire, it'll get annealed, it'll get soft. It's all going to come out in the wash, I think is what I'm trying to say. Also, like, hello, Cowlick. I, I see you very prominently on the stream. I need to cut my bangs. Anyway, so 10 gauge half round right wire. Now. Not right now. <laughs> no, I only do that immediately before stream with my metal shears. All right, so 10 gauge half round wire, 24 gauge sheet metal, a stone, um, and I, you could. I mean, you can theoretically do this with any size of stone, but when you're learning, sometimes it's easier to work macro than micro. So I'm gonna say, um, definitely get yourself a stone that is at least eight millimeters. So that's what this one is. Um, my strontium titanate is bigger. It's like a 10 millimeter stone. So eight to 10 millimeters. You could even do 12 millimeters. I'm gonna tell you how to figure out. I, I did actually, I cut my bangs with the metal shears before stream um, a yep. couple of months ago. Yep. <laughs> I was a witness. Heather was a witness. A reluctant witness. <laughs> uh, you're going to need some 18 gauge round wire. You don't need this much. You actually really only need about an inch, but I cut myself about three inches. So 18 gauge round wire. And then you're going to need easy solder and extra easy solder in your sterling silver solders. And typically you'll use sterling silver solder even if you're using a base metal. So now let's talk tools. There are so many of them. So, so very many tools. Okay, so... Um, you're going to need a torch. I think I'm, I almost blockaded my torch in there. Come here. All right, you're going to need a torch. I'm using my Blazer Butane torch, which, of course, everyone knows I absolutely adore. You're going to need two different kinds of soldering surfaces. You're going to need your hard soldering surface. That's my solderite that I use for almost everything. You're also going to need a soft soldering surface. The difference between a hard soldering surface and a soft soldering surface is a soft soldering surface you can actually press things into and it will stay. That's going to help you when it comes time to solder your prongs. You are going to need um, a metal shears is helpful but not necessary so I don't think that's on the supply list or tool list. You're going to need some steel wool. You're going to need two different kinds of files. You're going to need a flat file and then you're also going to need, which I'm hoping I have in my drawers here, otherwise I'm going to have to uh, send Heather on a mission. I can do a mission. I know, but I have so many things in my drawers, but I don't think I have. Womp womp. Okay, I need a triangular file or a square file. Okay. So you need a square or a triangular file. When did I make this class sample? I made this class sample uh, last week. Last week, Wednesday, or I think it was last week, Thursday, actually, that I made this class sample. So you're going to need both a flat file and a triangular file. You're going to need a drill, 
or a rotary tool and I'm going to use my lovely little variable speed Dremel and um, to put into your thank you so much to put into your rotary tool you're going to need a size you're gonna need a size 56 drill bit that is what's in Allison's drawers Hey, so that's, that's a big naughty. <laughs> that's a very personal question. <laughs> well, that's a naughty comment for a Thursday evening stream. <laughs> um, so size 52 drill bit. No, scratch that, size 56 drill bit. Did I write that? Yes, size 56. I did write it on there correctly. Um, that's the size that corresponds to your 18 gauge wire. Um, you're going to need a variety of hammers. Uh, so I'm going to be using my disc cutter, so I need my, my heavy ass brass hammer and then I'm probably going to need a mallet for forming my um, wire around my ring mandrel. I'm going to need a ring mandrel. Um, you're going to need all of your pliers, like all of them, probably not the round nose, but I just have them all in a pile. You need flux. I did put that on the list. You need a pickle and a pickle pot. Like I said, you're going to use a disc cutter for this, so you don't have to use a disc cutter. So if you don't have a disc cutter, you can absolutely do this with um, shears and a saw. Um, you can also do this with a pre-cut disc and a saw. And um, there are probably a lot of other things that I've forgotten. Like I said, I will remember. I'll let you know what they are when I remember that I forgot them. So let's go ahead and get this show on the road. So we are gonna start with the disc cutter. So we're gonna start with some um, banging on stream. Yes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to grab my stone. Watch out, Susan. <laughs> right, I'm about to start making lots of noise. Oh my gosh, one of, my, one of our clients was in this afternoon when I was doing uh, prototypes for next week's classes and I was using the disc cutter and I think she was a bit taken aback by the level of, of hammering coming from the back of the store. Frankly, she's not my favorite client, so I didn't really care. <laughs> I okay. didn't even see who that was. Uh, that was... It's okay. Uh, that was... Uh... I'll tell you later. Okay. Okay, so when I'm picking which punches to use um, from my disc cutter, what I want is I want to be able to create eep, a hole. Muppets? Muppets, right? <laughs> okay, so I need to create a hole that my stone will sit down into, but obviously not fall through. So I need, you know, some kind of differential between the size of that hole and the size of my actual piece. So I'm going to use this punch on my disc cutter as being something that is still smaller, still smaller than the diameter of my stone. Come on, light. Behave. That better? A little better. I have the focal distance set for, for soldering. So that's a little smaller than the diameter of my stone, um, but not, you know, not so small that my stone's going to sit up super high, not so big that my stone's going to fall through. Um, as far as the outside size of the disc, that's totally actually up to you. Like that's a, that's an artistic thing. You can make it significantly larger or you can make it fairly close in like I have. But when you're cutting a, a, a hole within a circle on a disc cutter, we're going to cut the hole first. So. This is my disc cutter. I love it. It's an awesome tool. As I've said before, if you are thinking of buying a disc cutter, they're amaze balls. They are fantastic. They are life changing. But don't don't buy the cheap one. It's so not worth it. Like I've had a cheap disc cutter at Beating Dreams for about a million years, so and we never it. use it because it's horrible and awful and so hard to use. So um, the disc cutter which we were gifted is probably about a two or $300 tool. It's amazing. It just cuts discs amazingly fast, cleanly, neatly. But you gotta think, am I really gonna cut that many discs? Now that being said, now that I have this beautiful disc cutter, I find excuses to cut discs. Um, you may have noticed a lot of <laughs> circular projects um, on the stream and that's because now I'm, I'm just looking for excuses to use this but 
seriously, if you're gonna buy a disc cutter, just invest in an expensive one because the cheap one's not worth um, the metal with which they're made. So I just kind of marked off um, the space that is gonna be my larger circle just so I kind of know where, um, where I wanna position it. So I'm gonna take that and I'm going to try and sort of eyeball that sort of centered up on my small circle. So this is the, the circle that I'm going to be cutting right here. So I've got my metal clamped in my disc cutter. It's going to get loud for a minute here. Actually, I'm just going to turn on the face cam because there's no point in you watching because you can't see. So I'm going to take my little punch. I'm going to drop that down into the hole and I'm going to whack on it until it cuts out a disc. It's going to get loud for a minute. So if you want to mute me, now's the time. All right. So now I have cut out from my sheet metal, and I didn't do a very good job of lining it up, but a uh, hole. So now I'm going to take my disc cutter, which I'm going to try and cut this larger disc here. I may have cut that hole too close to the edge, but I think I might just make it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to center that hole that I cut in that little well of my disc cutter, and I'm going to tighten it down. So when you're choosing the size for your bigger disc, yes, it is totally an artistic choice, but you do need to make sure that you have enough, you know, going around to put your prongs in. So you can't make it too close. You gotta usually go about two sizes up on your disc cutter. So again, here we go with the hammering. Everybody ready? One, two, three, go. <laughs> That's fair. Fat beans, this is a good, good choice for comedy. All right, and that's it for the disc cutter. Oh dear, that is not light. that's not a light tool, especially when you have all of the punches with it. It's heavy, but now I have some place to put my cup, so that's good. And what I have created is I have created a little sterling silver washer, and ideally my stone should. sit in my sterling silver washer. So this is a smaller stone than my than my prototype, so it's sitting down a little bit more. It's a little bit lower on the top, which is totally fine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, but all right, so that is my, that's my stone, that's my disc. That's awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna set that aside for a minute. Make sure I set my stone, stone somewhere that I know where it's gonna be. I'm done with my brass hammer, so I'm putting that up there to get it off of my work surface and give myself a little bit more space. I'm done with my sheet metal, so that can go away. Now let's go ahead and make our ring. So I am going to, since I already made a ring that fits me, I'm gonna go ahead and make a ring for sale tonight. So I'm gonna go for a size seven. Now, when we're wrapping wire around a mandrel, the wire is going to spring up, meaning that when you wrap it around the mandrel, it's gonna spring up, it's gonna get bigger. And um, when you release tension on it, it's going to, um, get to a bigger size. So if I'm going for a size seven ring, which is there, um, you could only use washers from the hardware, okay, you could use washers from the hardware store Ace if they're copper or brass, but not if they're nickel, because you're not gonna be able to get the solder to work. But if you can find pure copper or pure brass washers, you absolutely 100% could, without a doubt. Speaking of washers, let's put that one there so that I don't lose it. So I'm gonna go for a size seven. I'm gonna go up um, a couple of sizes to a size four, a couple, three sizes to a size four. I'm gonna take my half round 16 gauge wire and what I wanna do is I wanna wrap it around, come back here. I wanna wrap it around my mandrel and I wanna make sure that it's overlapped. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap it around my mandrel so I'm just holding the end like so and I'm gonna wrap it around my mandrel and I want a significant amount of overlap. So I run around almost one and a half times. So I let go of it and it, notice it's already sprung up like a size and a half, like it's now down to like a five and a half. So I'm just gonna wiggle this down to a size 
seven, which is the size I'm looking for. And then I just want to make a line so that I kind of know where the middle of my ring is. So I'm going to grab myself a marker. And I'm going to pick a place where I've got a decent curve, I've got some good overlap, and I'm just going to mark across both of those pieces of wire, like so, and then you can pull that off of your mandrel. Now, as far as this part here goes, it just needs to be high enough to accommodate the point of your stone. So the point of my stone is um, going to come down a little bit more on my class project than it is on my prototype, but this still should be sufficient. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut, because I don't need all of this wire, so I'm just going to cut myself just about there. That's a rough cut, so my, my lines here, I'm just going to cut about a half an inch beyond that. And then I'm going to grab my chain nose pliers. And I'm going to go at that line with my chain nose pliers and I'm just going to grab it. I'm going to brace my finger inside and I'm going to bend that back. And then I'm going to do the same on the other side, grab it at the line, bend it back so that now we have something that looks interestingly like my prototype ring. Okay, obviously we want those to match, so let's adjust this one that's looking weird. Stop looking weird. Nobody wants you to look weird. Especially but, me. But, no. Mm -mm. mm -mm. Alright, so that is going to be your ring prototype. You can just um, drop it on your mandrel to check for size. And I am solidly at a size 7, which is what I wanted. You can turn the AC down, though. I'm fine. I've got more sweaters. All right, I stripped. And I'm not having cold flashes like I was yesterday. Well, that's like, I don't know if there's such a thing as cold flashes that are that would be the opposite of hot flashes, but I was having them yesterday. I was so freezing, I could not feel my fingers that yesterday. Was, that has never been my problem. <laughs> <laughs> not ever in my life. Yeah. Well, I would have shared them with you if I could. Okay, so now that I have this ring base. I'm going to trim it. So we are going to look. So we're going to drop this in there and we're just going to eyeball, okay, how much, I swear this just keeps getting darker and darker. And I haven't changed the exposure at all, but we're just going to see how much, how far down this um, goes. And then I'm going to eyeball that much on my ring blink. And if you want to cut this higher so you get a higher ring, that's totally fine. Like there's no really right or wrong way to do this. I, being a person who works my, with my hands, I tend to make my rings as low as they possibly can be, but some people like the drama of a higher setting. All right, so then here we go with, I've cut this off. Now, what I need to do in order to solder this on is I need to flatten the top of this off because you'll notice my cuts, they're actually kind of angled away from the center and that's not gonna be really easy to solder onto my washer. So I'm gonna take my flat file and I'm just going to run it across the tops of my wires to file them flat in relation to, you know, a flat plate that's going to get soldered onto them this way. So my edges are getting nice and flat and shiny. Alright, I think that should be good. So now I've cut this, I filed this, we're going to set that aside for a moment, and now we're going to go back to our washer. Okay, so now it's time to drill our holes and solder in, hey Tally Fett, what you cooking in the kitchen? 
you're talking to uh, two hungry girls, so, you know, you can torture us as much as you want, but we may call you names. Just saying. <laughs> okay, so I've got my washer. So once again, I'm going to drop my stone in there, and I'm going to estimate where do I need to put... Ooh, lasagna soup. That sounds good. Um, I'm going to estimate where am I going to put my prongs. And for this stone, since it's a little bit smaller, it's sitting down a little bit further, I'm going to need to put my prongs fairly close to my to my hole. Oh, did I really like steal all of the Sharpies from myself today? I think I stole all my Sharpies from myself today. Do you need a Sharpie? No, I have a blue one. I just don't have any black ones. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to mark where I'm going to put these prongs. And I'm just going to make four dots. <laughs> it's true, I only have a blue Sharpie. So I've got four dots. Those are where I'm going to put the holes for my prongs. So this is where I'm going to grab my flex shaft. And I'm probably going to need to change the shaft because that's the annoying things about, thing about um, the Dremels is the chucks are, are not as versatile as the chuck in an actual flex shaft would be. So um, right now I've got a sanding disc in there, so I'm just going to close the drawer. I'm just going to um, loosen up the chuck on that. And so to change the, the collet, not on a Dremel, you just um, screw the chuck completely off, pull the collet nut out, insert the collet nut that has the size hole that you want, and then just go ahead and screw the, the chuck back down. And then I'm going to go ahead and take my size 56 drill bit, put that in there, and then screw it down nice and tight. And of course, your Dremel does come with a nice little wrenchy bit that you're going to use to just tighten up the last little bit. So now I have my size 56 drill bit, which is the size that corresponds to the 18 gauge wire that I have for my prongs. So now I'm going to take my little washer here and I'm going to drill four holes, one at each of those little marks. And be really cool as if I had brought a scrap of wood over here. here. Oh, I, ha I did! No, not cool. What happened? I dropped the Dremel on the floor. <sighs> it's not very nice of you, Dremel. It's okay. Everything actually stayed intact, including the drill bit. Yay! Okay, so I do have a little... Really, Dremel? It just really wants to be on the floor, apparently. So into gravity? It is. Okay, so I have my drill bit. I have a little block of wood that I'm going to use to drill on. So let's see. What can I... Oh, for goodness sakes. I can go over there. Seriously. So many tools. So not enough space for all of the tools for this tutorial. Okay, there I'm we go. I'm feeling you. Alright, so I'm just going to put that on there. And I can use that so that I don't, you know, drill into my boxes of letters. I'm going to turn on my Dremel. This is a variable speed, so I can turn the speed down, which is nice when you're doing something that's pretty precise like this. And um, when it's this tiny, I honestly don't bother to clamp it usually. I'm just going to take my tool. The camera is making this difficult. There we go. So once it catches, then I'm just going to press it down, and there's my hole. Now, could I have um, punched a starter for these? Of course I could have, and that would have been really smart. But that would have been another tool to write on the tool list. All right, there's my second one. So um, what would be the proper way to have done this? Um, was to take a centering punch and, and just punch a little dimple at each of my marks. That helps your drill bit catch. Um, it's a step that I oftentimes skip being the lazy person that I am, but it really does actually make your life easier. So 
Um, I, I highly recommend not the lazy person approach because it can be difficult. Okay, so there's my four holes in my little washer. So now we are going to fit our 18 gauge wire into the holes. We're gonna trim it and we're gonna solder it. So I'm gonna take my 18 gauge wire and ideally we want a tight fit on this. So I'm gonna decide which is the upside to this, which I'm gonna go with this side. Um, also, I could have used a template to mark those uh, holes and they would have been a little bit more, you know, even, but that's life. Okay, so none of this, all right, so it's a, it's a close fit, but it's not as tight as it could be. So um, I'm gonna have to do this a little bit of a different way. I'm gonna need to actually take my soft soldering surface, which is this one here. So this is, I'm sorry, I need a little bit more height on that one. So this is a kiln brick which is once again a soft soldering surface. So it's a surface that you can actually push things into and it will hold them for you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my washer and I'm gonna find a fairly flat place on my kiln brick. I'm gonna put it face down. Okay, so I've decided that this is the back side of this washer. I'm gonna take my 18 gauge wire and I'm gonna cut four pieces of it at about a half an inch each. Okay, you don't need that much wire. Half an inch is actually way overkill. Most professional jewelers will be like, why are you wasting wire like that? Because I'm paranoid, that's why. Because I am always completely paranoid that I'm gonna run out of wire. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a piece of 18 gauge wire, stick it down through each hole, and press it all the way down into the solder board. And if you wanna make your life easier and save yourself steps flush with the disc now this is not always possible so if you need to leave a little bit hanging out the back you can and you can file that down later it's just so much easier if you can um, save yourself that step so once again I'm taking that I'm setting it down in that hole I'm pressing it down and I'm gonna press it down until it is sorry I'm gonna let go with my pliers and then I'm gonna press it down till it's level with the disc. Okay, so once again, so I've got two pieces of wire in there, got two more to go. Um, so yeah, soft soldering surfaces, super helpful for doing things like soldering prongs and such. Um, absolutely love mine. All right, there's three, one more to go. Drop it down in there. And then press. Okay, so I've got four wires in there and they're all level and even with the back of my disc. So when I'm soldering prongs on like this, um, this is easier and better for a number of reasons than just kind of trying to, to solder them to smack on top of that disc. Number one, you get a way better connection because you've got you know the actual physical connection of them going down through the disc plus the solder number two so much easier to solder them like if you just imagine trying to hold them with the tweezers and set them on on the front of the disc and it's just a recipe for disaster and frustration so now i'm going to go ahead and take my flux and i'm going to paint flux onto the back of my setting, which is of course the part that is currently sitting upright on my soldering board. So I'm just going to take my flux and I'm going to paint the whole back of that with flux. So let's talk for just a second about what flux is, what it does, and why we need it. So flux is a protectant. What it does is it keeps your metal from oxidizing. So when you hit a metal that is not sterling, or sorry, that is not pure silver or pure gold with a torch, the first thing, the very first thing that's going to happen is the base metal component of that metal is going to oxidize. It's going to turn black. That's bad because we can't solder on oxidized metal. Your sterling silver solder literally will not flow when your metal is oxidized. So we put flux on the metal that protects the metal, prevents that oxide layer from forming, and makes the soldering possible. Also, I am about to 
light a torch so before I cut my solder let's do the very quick five point soldering safety lecture um, number one try your best to keep six to eight inches of clear space around your soldering station at all times no I'm not doing that I've got cameras right up in my soldering station space that totally bit me in the ass last year when I melted my webcam on stream so seriously if you have things you care about including you know your house six to eight inches of clear space as long as you do that the chances that you will accidentally melt something or set something on fire are significantly reduced number two once you've had a flame going in your workspace from that point forward assume that everything in your workspace is hot enough to burn you because a lot of it is even if it doesn't look like it number three ventilation is important if you find yourself feeling uncomfortable in the lung area after you've been soldering listen to that you may need to re-examine your ventilation situation. You may need to go by a window. You may need to install a vent hood. You may need to go outside, okay? There are chemicals that are being burned off during this process that bother some people more than others. So make sure you listen to what your body is trying to tell you. Number four, if you're not actively soldering with your torch, turn it off. Super easy to turn it off. Super easy to ignite it. No reason to leave it burning when you're not actively using it. And Number five, if you are working in your home workspace, make sure that you have a fire extinguisher within arm's reach. If you're working in a community workspace, make sure that you know where the fire extinguisher is. Now, once again, I have absolutely no credentials at all regarding safety. There's absolutely no reason you should listen to me. I'm just some rando on the internet, but I have been teaching soldering for about seven or eight years now, and there are some things that consistently come over or come up over and over again about being safe in your own workspace or maintaining safety in a community workspace you know that are pretty universal of course if you're creating your own workspace at home please consult actual experts do everything you can to make your home workspace as safe as possible and i'm going to cut my solder so very small pieces okay just like a sixteenth of an inch and i'm going to cut four of them and i'm just putting them down on the table in front of me for the moment because then i'm going to take tweezers Tweezer is very important tool having to have in your soldering workspace. Why? Well, because hot things for one, tiny things for two. So I'm going to place a piece of solder, little tiny chip of solder, at each prong. I'm just going to set it there. And since this is um, since it's a flat surface, it should stay pretty easily. If it, you find it's not staying, just go ahead and dab a little bit more flux there, and the the flux will kind of hold it in place. Would have worked much better for me if I had done that before I gave a whole lecture on all the things. So that's three, and this one is four. All right, so now that we all know how to be safe, it's time to light the torches and let's see can we see that there we go now we can see that so i'm going to light my torch um, i am going to grab a solder pick from my right hand this is just um, something that i can use to poke or move things should i need to and i'm just going to start heating this whole thing now when i heat my solder may or sorry my flux may boil and kick my solder off so i just want to make sure that i'm heating gently i'm sort of you know, skating around the edges, and then once my flux starts to um, turn clear, I know it's not going to boil anymore, and then I can sort of concentrate my heat on the piece. Once my flux is all turned clear, I know that I've reached the point where my solder can flow, so I'm going to concentrate on each of these pieces of solder individually, and what I want is I want to get them to flow. There we go. All right, so I want to get them to flow on my prongs. All right, I want them to join. Ooh, also, don't point the torch at your fingers. I want to make sure that they actually join my prongs to my washer. All right, so I did that. Um, sometimes you just have to get a little extra heat in there because you want to make sure that your solder doesn't just flow around the outsides, but it actually flows into those holes you made and joins your prong wires to your disc. Now I'm going to gently pry this out of my solder board. And as long as everything comes with, which it did, hey presto. I have succeeded. So now I'm going to, now that I've checked and made sure that everything is good, I'm going to actually put this back into my solder board. And the only reason that I that I did pull it out is because if it didn't solder 
together, I would have to take care of that before I did anything else. So now that I have confirmed that I did successfully solder all of my prongs on, I'm just going to flip this puppy right back over, find another spot in my soldering board that's fairly flat. And this one, notice how that one's kind of cattywampus. I'm gonna just gonna straighten that one out a bit. With the pliers, because this is hot. There we go. I'm just gonna find another spot on my solder board and I'm just gonna press that right back down. And that's just so that everything is nice and supported while I'm soldering on my band because even though I'm gonna use a lower um, density of solder for my band, I wanna make sure that if my solder reflows on my prongs, that they're supported. So now I'm gonna go ahead and, I've probably got plenty of flux back here, but I'm just gonna reflux the back of my setting. And I'm gonna to switch to my extra easy solder. So let's talk briefly about densities of solder. So sterling silver solder is going to be sterling silver, which is silver and copper, alloyed with zinc. What the zinc does is it drops the melting point of your solder down below the melting point of the silver with which you're working. So that's what allows the soldering to actually happen um, without your whole piece melting into a big pile of sterling slag. But when you're doing a piece that has multiple joints, you have to be a little bit more... Um, on it than just that. Um, so they make stuck there. They make different densities or different melting points of solder by adding different amounts of zinc into the alloys. This allows you to do more complicated paste pieces with multiple joints without having to worry about destroying the joints that you've already soldered in service of your future joints. So now what I'm gonna do is I've taken my extra easy solder, which is a lower melting point solder than my easy solder that I used to solder my prongs in, and I've placed um, two pieces, one uh, directly opposite each other on my backside still of my setting. I'm going to go ahead and sweat those onto my setting. So what that means is I'm gonna burn off all the flux and I'm going to melt the solder. So I'm going to heat until the solder flattens out and then I'm going to stop. Alright, so that solder is flat. Now I'm going to stop. I'm going to grab my ring shank that I made. I fluxed the ends of it. I'm going to hold my ring shank and you could totally do this in a third hand. Let's spread that just a bit so that it actually fits. Um, you could absolutely hold this in a third hand. You don't have to hold it using a regular hand tweezers like I am. And you're going to set it so that it's going to set against those two pieces of solder that you melted. Light your torch again. Watch your hand. Watch your hand and your camera. And you're going to heat. That's a better angle. And I'm going to heat until those two pieces of solder reflow and join everything together. So I've got my left hand one is good. Just waiting for my right hand one to go. Awesome. Take your torch away. All right. Didn't melt my nails. Didn't burn. Didn't burn any of the hair off my hands. So we're going to call this a win. Um, so now we're going to just grab this and we're going to try and pull everything out. And there we go. It all came together. It means it's all soldered together. So now we're going to drop that into the pickle. And this is going to give me an opportunity to, I know, yay, success. This is going to give me an opportunity to talk about pickle. What is pickle and what does it do? So pickle is a weak acid solution. And what it does is it cleans all of the gunk, um, all the flux residue, all of the oxides, just all of the, you know, kind of gross stuff off of your metal so that you can do one of two things. Um, you can use pickle as a way to clean in between um, soldering passes. So if you're doing a very complicated piece that has multiple joints, you actually can pickle in between um, each joint or series of joints just because solder sometimes gets a little bit grouchy about flowing onto um, oxidized and dirty metal. It doesn't really like it. 
So uh, you can pickle in between joints to clean your metal up, make it easier to solder on. Now that being said, I am a very lazy pickler. I do not pickle nearly as much as most jewelers do. Um, the gal that taught me, seriously, she pickled before she started and then after every single joint, I do not have that kind of patience. So typically I will pickle at the end of the project or if I'm noticing that it's becoming difficult for me to solder, I will, I will do an intermedi intermediary pickling, but I usually won't do that unless I'm having trouble. So the piece stays in the pickle until it is clean, meaning basically all of the black crud is gone from it and it has acquired this surface finish, which is called pickle white, okay? So basically that's kind of a matte white surface finish that results from um, a layer of fine silver being deposited on your piece because when you heat metal, that is an alloy, like sterling silver, and the metal oxidizes, as sterling silver does, the part of the metal that oxidizes, the part of the alloy that oxidizes is the base metal component, okay? So it's the part that's not pure silver or pure gold. Oh, well, look at that. I was messing with it and I popped it off. Which is why you shouldn't futz with it, because if you futz with it too much, you're gonna futz it up. All right, so that just means that I'm going to, so what I was trying to do is I was trying to level out my setting. And so what I think I need to do in order to make that happen is I need to file this a little bit flatter. So I'm going to just take a file to that. I'm going to try and re-solder it. And then I'll talk to you more about that allergy. So yes, if you screw it up like this, you really do have to pull down all of the soldering equipment that you just put away. Don't it up. I already did fence it up. It's too late for me. But Heather, oh. Heather is just advising the stream, don't fence it up. Okay, so I'm just going to grab down my soft soldering surface. I'm just going to put this face down and smash it back in there and I'm going to hopefully do a quickie repair on this and then pop it back in the pickle. So, you know, sometimes this is, this is how it works. You know, some days you're on your game and some days you screw up on the internet. Some days you do both. It's true. <laughs> well, Heather maintains that I'm impressive even when I'm screwing up. I do. I'll take it. All right, so I re-soldered that. Hopefully it's more secure this time. Back it goes into the pickle. And uh, continuing on the, the metallurgy lecture. So when we, when we heat a metal that is alloyed, what oxidizes is actually the, thanks Amy, what oxidizes is actually the base metal content of that alloy. So that's what the pickle does is it cleans off all of those base metal oxides and leaves you with a layer of the pure metal on the surface of your piece. So all we have to do to get a shiny piece is we need to then buff that layer of pure metal to make it shiny. Um, also, if you throw your piece into the pickle hot, it will pickle, pickle faster than if you throw it in after you've let it cool. All right, so I'm not going to mess with it. I do have everything is soldered together at this point, except it isn't, you jerk face. Well, you were being nice, but this ring is not being nice because I keep putting away my soldering stuff. All right, we're trying, we're gonna do one more, one more try. Maybe skip putting away. I know, right? Maybe skip putting away the soldering stuff until I'm sure it's worked. 
What? You're crazy. Like, when you turn off streaming. <laughs> right? Well, there's not room for it, is the problem. Well. <laughs> so, alright, so this is attempt number three to get this to solder. I promise. Not that bad, honest. There's my tweezers. Uno mas. Hopefully successfully this time. Really? You're just going to do me like that, huh? What? Right? Yeah, well, it is... Ha ha! Nope! Alright, this has officially become an episode of Allison Screws Up on the Internet. That's super not exciting in any way, shape, or form. I completely melted it, like absolutely and completely just like melted this poor thing into oblivion. Like I don't know that this is salvageable at this point. I really don't. You made sculpture! I made, no, this is, okay, so this is dead. This is officially done. So um, let's go ahead, since I failed utterly to create this project in front of you guys, let's, let's talk about a little bit of dissection about what I did wrong because I was um, hurrying and um, trying to cut corners because I was on stream and I was trying to finish in a reasonable amount of time. So um, let's start with, all right, number one, why did this not solder on in the first place? And it is 100%, that's still a little hot, it's 100% due to the filing on the top. So I didn't file at quite the right angle on this side here. Well, now that I'm not soldering, I can turn up the brightness of that. D -d -d. That one, you're the one. Okay, so, all right, so first thing is you can see here that this one isn't flat. Okay, I didn't do a good job of, of filing that flat, so therefore there wasn't enough contact for it to properly, okay, I can touch that now, properly solder onto my disc. So that's that's problem number one. Problem number two is when I went to, to try and solder that again, I did not actually um, press this all the way flat into my soldering board. Um, I left a little bit of, and I'm not gonna, like now it's too cattywampus, I can't press it in anywhere, but I left it hovering a little bit above, about a sixteenth of an inch above my soldering surface. And so I had to be really careful that I didn't reflow the solder on my prongs um, while I was trying to re-solder my band on. I thought it worked the first time, but I took my heat off too soon, put it in the pickle, it didn't work. Okay, so next time did the same thing, and then that's when everything went so incredibly wrong. So first thing is all of my solder reflowed. So you can see my prongs that were flush with the, the bottom of my disc. They've totally pressed through because what happened is that solder reflow, the disc dropped down that eighth or sixteenth of an inch that I had that hovering over the top of my, um, over the top of my solder board. Um, number two, in an effort to um, try and get this piece, which still isn't filed really correctly, to solder onto this, I put too much heat into it and I melted, look at the sides of my disc, completely melted. Not only that, but this prong right here, um, it melted, it's right through its hole, so it won't even stay, like there's not a hole anymore there, it's just a U shape. So, so yeah, this is literally not salvageable. So. I think what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to say, hey, I screwed up. I did not successfully create this project. Um, since I know that most of the five of you um, know. So let's talk about salvaging things. When something like this happens to you, like what can you salvage, what can't you? Okay, there's nothing wrong with this. This is totally reusable. This ring is totally fine. All I have to do is file all that solder crap off the top of it, and I can reuse this. This is, this is toast. The only things about this 
that are remotely salvageable if I wanted to was I could could chop off these pieces of wire but I'm probably not even gonna bother so what we're gonna do is since I know that most of you all are um, regular stream viewers anyway tomorrow is freeform Friday that means that's the day where I get to pick any project and do it on stream so I'm gonna give myself a second chance at this project tomorrow so I am going to keep this ring and I'm gonna um, cut myself so basically I'm gonna cut myself a new disc I'm gonna solder in my prongs and then I'm gonna see if I can proceed to the end of the project with you guys on Freeform Friday. So um, we're going to complete, we're going to do, do our second chance, um, take two of this project, the Halo Ring, uh, tomorrow during our Freeform Friday stream. Because if I start again now, we're not going to be done until 8 o'clock. And I know everyone has other things that they want to do with their night. So just goes to show you that everybody can have a bad day and everybody can utterly screw up their project in front of, you know, five to ten people on the internet. Um, so anybody who's watching this on the replay, I'm so sorry that you're not going to see the conclusion of this project tonight, but I promise um, I will be back tomorrow on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream with our freeform um, Friday project. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take this disaster and I'm going to show you, you know, what can be salvaged, what can't be salvaged and and how to proceed when you have this this amount of incredible like meltdown and, and just kind of horror that happens to your project. So that's what it's going to be tomorrow night. It's going to be a salvage mission for our Halo ring and we will complete that on stream tomorrow evening. So um, that is going to be it for me <laughs> this evening. I promise I have no more plans this evening to do anything that involves fire or chemicals. I swear. Well, um, you know, one. well, cross, cross my heart, like nothing, nothing more dangerous is happening with me tonight. And we will revisit this project again tomorrow. So thank you all so much for hanging out with me um, for my somewhat tragic Halo Ring tutorial. Um, but once again, there are, as Lori said, always things to be learned from our mistakes. And it's always, um, you know, kind of nice in a situation like this, I think, to know, okay, what can what can I take forward from this? Like what's usable, what's not usable? Um, and how do I take this disaster and turn it into a finished project? So that's going to be Freeform Fridays tomorrow. So I'm Allison from Beating Dreams in Dallas, Texas. We are, of course, an actual brick and mortar retail bead store. We are here on Lover's Lane in Dallas, and we are <laughs> um, open for business Monday through Saturday from 1 to 6. So if you're here local in Dallas, of course, you can come see us anytime during those hours. If you're not local in Dallas, you can find us on this channel, twitch.tv forward slash beating dream five times a week with complimentary tutorials plus um, Tuesday and Thursday, sorry, Wednesday and Saturday evenings with live merchandise sales. So everyone have a great night and um, I will see you all hopefully tomorrow for the redo of the, or the continuation. It's not really a redo because I'm not going to redo the whole thing. I'm just going to start from, from where I left off with this tragedy and then we're going to go forward from there. So the continuation of Halo Ring is going to be tomorrow night during Freeform Friday. So everyone have a great night and have a wonderful Friday and I'll see you all back on this channel. Twitch.tv forward slash beating dream tomorrow at 6 when we salvage this project.